Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, uh, what I'd like to share with you today is um, a little bit uh, different, I guess, from from um, the last the last presentation, in that um, what, what I've been trying to do um, for my own satisfaction is to try to understand what is this mixture of religion and finance. It, it always seemed um, seemed uh, like a strange uh, cocktail to me, and I'm trying to figure out what exactly is going on, and I've. I, I think I'm probably going to die before I figure it out, but at least I'll keep trying, and, and Dr. Yeh has been kind enough to keep inviting me every year. Uh, so every year, I guess I get to share with you my, my latest iteration, understanding what's going on. And my view right now is that basically the phenomenon of Islamic finance, as it exists today globally, is a symptom of, of a fundamental disease uh, of Muslim societies. So what I want to do is go to the core of trying to understand what is really uh, a prohibition about, uh, and in particular the prohibition of riba, and, um, and um, why do we have Islamic finance now? So please, the next, uh, the next slide. So we start with, at the beginning, why, why would we have a prohibition? It's okay, thank you. Why, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid something? Uh, or if, uh, if we don't want to go to religious uh, mandated prohibitions, after all, uh, in Hindu law and the Code of Hammurabi and so on, which were not Abrahamic, the same prohibition of riba was there. Why would you need a prohibition? Well, you would need a prohibition if you can't convince people that something is bad for them. And as, as all religions are paternalistic in nature, we say, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He knows all our faults. And he knows that if we're not forbidden from doing something, we're probably going to do it. Now, in many cases, um, you can just explain to somebody that don't you know, drown yourself. Don't shoot yourself in the head. Well, that's, that's easy to explain. But when, when the prohibition is so strict, as in the case of riba, I think it's precisely because people will think that uh, they, this is something they would like to do, but for some reason it's bad for them. Uh, this morning I've already pointed to some of these uh, issues, but I'll, I'll try to elaborate on them now. So it must be true that individuals, if left to their own devices, will use riba, but at the same time this is something that will hurt them in the long term. And the analogy I like to draw, uh, and, and I've, been, I've been thinking about more and more now, is about um, the, the analogy to the prohibition of khamr, uh, of the imbibing of khamr. And, um, so I went into the books of, of uh, Islamic legal theory to even read about how, how they came to the prohibition, say, of wine or beer, when the only one that's mentioned in the Quran is khamr, which is made of dates. And they talk about the intoxicating factor and so on. It's not you know, the redness of the drink. It's not the fact that it's a liquid, etc. But I think they miss something, because khamr is always mentioned in conjunction with maisir in Quran. It's always al-khamr wal maisir al-khamr wal maisir uh, yes, they're addictive substances. One is addictive chemically, the other is addictive psychologically. But they're addictive, they're both addictive, and that's why they're always mentioned together. It's something where once you get into it, once you get used to gambling or once you get used to wine, it's very hard to wean yourself off of it. I think riba is very much the same way, and that's why the prohibition comes gradually to wean one off that, uh, that addiction. So uh, in, in, in the prohibition of wine, it comes very briefly. First, la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara, and then, uh, and then uh, of course, uh, it's, it's, completely, um, it's completely wiped out. So you can drink, but just don't pray when you're drunk, and then eventually, you say, don't even come near it. The same is true with riba. At first, the, the first verses in, in, um, in, in uh, the Surah Al-Rum, uh, just says, well, it doesn't really multiply. Um, uh, you know, riba may, may, it may look like it's multiplying in your money, but it doesn't really multiply with Allah. And then the comparison, whereas in the case of khamr, it's always khamr and maisr to show the, the analogy. In the case of riba, it's always contrasted with charity. The, the, the riba that you try to multiply your money with, that will never multiply in the eyes of Allah. But when you give charity, that is what's really multiplied. So that's not a prohibition, it just says this is not your best use of money. And then later on, in Surah Ali Imran, just don't eat a double that multiplied, which is basically Hindu law, that you can increase, but once it reaches the principle, you don't add any more interest. And then finally, So just give it all up. Um, 
the same, the same kind of idea as society is addicted to, to unlimited credit. But so, so, so uh, we can see the parallels here. And then the prohibition is there because um, unlike in the case of wine, where you can live without it, so there's no reason to get onto that slippery slope. Um, it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells us that there is benefit in this. But the sin is bigger than the benefit. So eventually avoid it completely because it's a slippery slope. Yes, a little bit may be good for you, but you get to be alcoholic and you lose it. In the case of credit, however, an economy cannot survive without credit. It is the abuse of the credit and the over-addictiveness that becomes harmful. So you have to still have it. Without, without the allocation of credit, there is no finance. Uh, people who are hardworking but don't have money cannot get the money of the rich. And I disagree about you know, the, the, those, those people who are parasites and so on, because after all, a silent partner is doing the same thing. He has a lot of money, he just invests it, and somebody else works with it. Why credit specifically and why this particular prohibition? So I, I, what I'm trying to do, I guess, is to understand to, to my own satisfaction, hopefully, and hopefully I can, I can help others also think about these issues, why these particular limitations were put in place, and then why what was written down in jurisprudence over the centuries, trying to understand what the forbidden riba is and how to avoid it, uh, was really just the, uh, the, the product of their own economics. And maybe if we try to apply our economic understanding now, we'll come up with a different story. So if I can have the next slide. Um, what Islamic finance has become today is what I call Sharia arbitrage. Um, arbitrage is um, uh, what you do is if you find something that sells for $5 in one place, $6 in another place, you buy it where it's cheap and sell it where it's expensive. That's called an arbitrage. Um, in, in the case of Islamic finance, by the admission of the uh, governor of the uh, Bahrain Monetary Authority, who you know, has been sponsoring a lot of the offshore Islamic finance all around the world now, uh, says, look, you know, we've grown because we, we can appeal to this captive market. And, and this, is, this is the fundamental thing about Sharia arbitrage, that some people feel, well, the only way we can participate in financial markets is if somebody uses this medieval jurisprudence to manufacture a new set of instruments. And so the captive market is necessary. That basically, to them, even an infinite price would not be uh, 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 too high. So you know, I just can't live there, period. And uh, you know, the only, the only uh, uh, and of course, if it's if it's selling at six percent somewhere else, then I can always sell it to them at seven percent or eight percent and make a profit, and that would be the Sharia arbitrage. Now, if I can have the next slide, so the, so the market is there, and everybody now is admitting finally that it's there. Now, there is a strong temptation to cater to this Sharia arbitrage. You scour the ancient books, and you find that in the ancient books they say a certain contract is forbidden, haram. For instance, an interest-bearing loan. And this is unanimous, and everybody's unanimous on this to this day. But then you find some other contracts that, with a little bit of twiddling, can do the same thing. For instance, like a Moraba high cost plus sale or a lease. I can charge somebody a markup on the price. I can charge somebody rent and essentially get the interest, even though it's no longer an interest-bearing loan. So what I have to do is take those old contracts and then play around with them a little bit, still maintain some noticeable difference because otherwise I can't have the brand name. I can't sell it as Islamic and, and get the Sharia arbitrage. So if I can have the next slide. Thank you. So how do the mechanics work? Well, the mechanics, and you don't see this as much in the US, but think about it this way. Money for money, everybody agrees that is forbidden riba, right? Cash now for cash later with interest. That is, the for, it's an interest-bearing loan that was forbidden at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It will be forbidden till Yawm Al-Qiyamah, as Sheikh was saying. Then, well, but what do you do? Well, you introduce a property in between. So this is called Bay al -Ina. So I sell you a pencil and say, well, you have to pay me back a dollar ten cents in a year. And then I turn around and, and, um, and, and buy it right back from you and pay you a dollar now. The net result is that you got the dollar and you have to pay me a dollar ten later on. And this is called bay al ayna meaning the same item is sold and then resold. And this is uh, forbidden by the text of a hadith, with uh, about bid as along other things that, that uh, signal basically the, the decay of Islam. Um, but even then, uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, 
understood it as still questionable. He said, well, what is really the forbidden bay al is if the two sales are included in the original contract. If I say, I, I will buy this pencil from you, and then I will turn around and sell it back, and it's all in one contract. And it's really the same prohibition as bay'atayni fi bay'a, which is another hadith. So he basically lumped it. But that's only in Imam al-Shafi'i. He said, well, we can't, if, if, they are two, if they are conducted as two separate sales, we can't really judge that this is forbidden, because each sale by itself is, is perfectly permissible. Uh, but the vast majority of the jurists, including in the Shafi'i school, don't agree with that view. Uh, his point was you can't judge on intentions. Their point is, well, it's, it's an obvious hila, and there is a text that at least can be understood to apply to that hila. So, so what do they do now in the Gulf? And anywhere you go in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Bahrain, Qatar, you will find that they offer you something called tawarruq. They offer it in different names. They call it tamwil um, al-shamil in Bahrain, and they call it uh, at taysir in Saudi Arabia, and so on. And Tawarruq says, okay, so there's a, a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that I can't take the pencil, sell it, and buy it back. What if I get a third person? So I, 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 I sell it to you, and you sell it to him. Uh, now, all of a sudden, uh, within the Hanbali school, we find a very large number of jurists who say, oh, that's permissible. Even though some jurists uh, obviously disagreed. Well, uh, you can always go one more level for those who are still not satisfied. Well, let's get a fourth person. Let's, you know, I sell it to you, you sell it to him, he sells it to a fourth person, and then I buy it from that fourth person. Basically, it's a theorem. You can always create enough camouflage to make anything into riba. And that's why I get back to the exploitation thing. If somebody is needy and, and you say, no, no, I can't lend you $100 and, I'll, and, and get 110 later on, I'll just sell you something above its price. It's, 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 it's so trivial to do. And that is how riba was, was uh, and, and, and to not call that riba is basically playing around with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, 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 if the intent is to exploit somebody, it's certainly riba, but riba is not only about exploitation, it's about other stuff as well. So if we can have the next slide. Okay, so here is, here is the actual uh, uh, technique that, that they've used in, in the financing. And I'm showing an example, uh, particularly of murabaha, because I don't know, I, I know Lariba doesn't use murabaha, so you can uh, <laughs> feel comfortable at least that I didn't come and, and eat the dinner and then, and then condemn uh, your model. Um, So, and, and here's how it works. So you start, okay, so we said the, the jurors, you find that, that uh, a, a, an interest rate bearing loan is forbidden, but credit sales are permissible, and credit sales with a markup are permissible. So you take murabaha and say, well, if I already owned the house, and then I sold it to you at a markup, and even if you have to pay me later on, that's perfectly permissible. Well, it's a small step then to say, well, I don't actually own any homes. I'm not in the business of owning homes. You want to buy the home, so what I'll do is I'll buy it, and then I'll sell it to you at a markup, and you pay me over time. And then they found that that was a little bit onerous. So they said, well, what I'm going to do also is I'm going to hire you as my buying agent. So you buy the house that you want to buy on my behalf. Oh, but I go one step further. So you're going to be my buying agent. You're also going to be my selling agent. So you go, you buy the house on my behalf, and then you sell it to yourself on my behalf. And this is halal, but the interest-bearing loan was haram. Um, they went further, and I, I have a particular jurist in mind. I, I will name him on a different thing, but uh, uh, HSBC, for instance, and they publicize this, f f uh, frequently ask questions about their auto financing in the Gulf. He said, well, people ask us these questions a lot, but uh, you know, where do you come up with the money that you're going to use for, for lending me? And they say, well, we're actually going to use our regular banking money that you know, if you came for an auto loan, we would have used the exact same money, but now we're going to use it for a Sharia compliant transaction instead. I say, oh, interesting. So, and how much are you going to charge me? They say, well, we'll charge you the same interest rate. We're going to charge those other guys as well. Um, but, but ours is perfectly Islamic because we have the fatwa. So basically, it's the same money. You buy the car and then buy it and then sell it to yourself. We charge you the same interest rate, but somehow this is fundamentally different. Um, if, if I can have the, um, the next slide. So, and where is the difference? So, Justice Taqi Osmani explains the difference here. And, and it's again appealing to a medieval juristic uh, rule about what they call um, uh, daman, uh, the, the, the uh, guarantee 
which sometimes is also interpreted as risk for for uh, for property. So well, the difference is that you can't um, you can't earn an income unless you bore some risk. So um, it, it, possessions in Islam, there are only two types of possession that jurists recognize: qabd al amana and qabd al daman. Either I hold it as a trust for somebody else, or I hold it with guarantee. Uh, in which case, if it's destroyed, it's my property that's lost, not the other person's. Uh, of course, in, in the case of a holding of trust, it's, uh, you still have to guarantee it against your own uh, transgression, but, but you don't guarantee it against uh, an act of God. So he says, well, you see, here's the difference. Um, even though we're going to appoint this person to go find the car they want, buy it on our behalf, and all they have to do is basically call us on the phone and say, okay, I need $15,000 to buy it on your behalf, and, and we wire the money. And then he buys it on our behalf, and then he calls us again and says, now, as you're selling agent, I'm going to sell it to myself. They say, well, between those two periods of time, you actually, as the bank, own the car. Because the agent bought it on behalf of you, and therefore, if it was destroyed at that time before he sold it back to himself, you owned it. And that's why you are entitled to get the interest, whereas in the case, well, they wouldn't call it interest. But, uh, but in, in, in the other case, you wouldn't be. So in this split second between the time you bought it on behalf of the bank and the time you sold it to yourself. Now this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's sadly laughable. When I show this to my students, they are rolling on the floor quite literally. And the Muslims, of course, are crying out of, I mean, if this is, if this is how, what we've reduced our religion to, we have a much more serious problem than anything we would have thought. So next slide, please. So what is, what is riba really? And, and I don't know that we can come up with an answer. But I have my definition that I think is, is appropriate, and, and I think I presented that in one of the earlier symposiums, and the paper is up. Uh, it, it gets a little involved, and that's why um, I, I tried not to go over it again. But basically, the, the most important thing on this slide is say, well, let's just not call it interest anymore, because there is riba without interest, and there is interest without riba. Uh, all these murabahas, all these ijaras, and so on, it's all interest-based. It's just how you determine the interest rate and the nature of the contract that changes, but it, they are interest-based. And any first-year MBA student will call this interest. Now you call it implied interest, you call it what you want, rate of return, anything else, it's still interest. Um, but we, we've seen, and I've said this in, in previous symposia, and I see the same faces year after year, so you've heard this before, uh, that's not an appropriate. You can't call it usury, and you can't call it renting of money either because it applies to all other commodities. And we have to remember when people say, well, money is not a commodity, Money, of course, was always a commodity. Uh, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the al-Snaf is sitta, the six commodities that are mentioned in the hadith on riba, they're all commodities. And, and, uh, so, um, and it's not about exploitation either. Exploitation, obviously, is one of the reasons, but we can't reduce it just to exploitation. This was actually debunked a thousand years ago uh, by, uh, well, a little bit later than that, but Taqid uh, Subki in his continuation of, of, um, of Majmu'ah, of, uh, Imam in, Nawawi in, in Shafi'i jurisprudence said this is obviously not the point because I can always affect the exploitation by just selling cows for cows and, and the rules of riba don't apply there. They only apply to fungible commodities. So that's not the point. We have to, we have to look a little bit deeper. Um, so the, the, the bottom line is any simplistic definition of riba is not going to work. If you use a simplistic definition of riba, then it's very easy to circumvent it. It's trivial to circumvent it. That is the disease we have. We want to simplify the religion, and then we want to find ways around it. And that's how we end up with Sharia arbitrage. Please, next slide. So my, my story, and again, I'm not going to go through it all, but my story is that um, basically humans are dynamically inconsistent in economic lingo, or basically they make plans and then they don't follow through. Somebody says, well, I need to, to uh, go to college in order to get a good job, so I'm going to borrow money. And I go to Sally May and I get the loan. And then now that I, as soon as I graduate, I'm going to save half my income and I'm going to pay off my student loans. But as soon as I get my job, well, I have to get a nice apartment and I have to get a nice stereo and I have to get a nice car. So I'm just going to borrow a little bit more. But once I have my first promotion, I'm going to start saving 50% of my income and pay off all my student loans and my consumption loans. But then, of course, once, you're, once you have your promotion, well, I need a nicer car. I need to live in a nicer area to keep up with the Joneses. And so I'm going to borrow even more. And that's how you get into the debt cycle. And, and so the, the, the way to stop this is to have a pre-commitment mechanism. And the pre-commitment comes through the prohibition, which doesn't say you can't have credit. 
I remember the Krehe once said that they, they, they believe credit is a human right or something, basic human right. And I mean, you need credit, otherwise people can never get out of a poverty trap. So you need the credit and the, 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 the problem is how do you make sure that this credit is not abused in a way that is addictive? Um, now, if, if with alcohol you could actually give people injections, well, not alcohol, but hammer or something, just the right amount and you can never get, well, but that's not how you imbibe it. In the case of credit, well, if you cancel it completely, people will die. So the solution is to allow credit but put so many restrictions. And the restrictions, as they were understood, there's nothing about murabaha or ijara or any of this stuff in, in the Quran and the Sunnah. These were contracts that just existed. And so people said, well, those are the contracts. Let's just explain what the rules are for these contracts so we won't have riba. And then, of course, you take a medieval mind together with a 21st century lawyer, and you know you're going to play funny games with this stuff. You, you, you can run circles around the, the medieval jurist and do what, exactly what you want to do within his rules. Right? Uh, if, if, if they could see all these tricks and understand them, they would, they would plug all these holes as well. So, um, in my opinion, actually, the current regulatory framework is exactly uh, what we have. Um, I, as I said earlier, and I feel now it's my responsibility to say this, I have a conventional mortgage and I have conventional auto loans, and I feel there's nothing wrong with it. Now, I'm not a faqih, and I cannot uh, say anything. But... <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't see the difference. Sure. sure. It's just a matter of convenience for me. Yeah, but the, the, the main point is I never borrowed money. Sure. So the, yeah, my point is, well, I mean, if you tell me that I, I never borrowed money, my, my banker, I'm not going to name who they are, my, my banker never wrote me a check and then I turned around and used that money to buy a home. They wrote the check to the builder who built my home. And then I make the payments exactly the same way. It's just a legal nicety. Uh, they never paid me money to buy my car. They paid directly the auto manufacturer, and I got the car. So um, I think actually that a lot of what the medieval jurisprudence was trying to do has been done in the society. It's, it's impossible for me to go there and say, oh, lend me a million dollars, $10,000. They're not going to just loan me $10,000. They want to know what I want to do with it. And if I want to buy a property, they're going to buy it on my behalf, and I'll pay them in installments. So the difference can't be on these mechanics. Right? The, the, the difference has to be somewhere else. So, so my, my understanding, and, and I'm, again, I'm not a jurist, so I, this is not an example. And, and, and the paper is there again. I think that RIBA is about trading in credit. Trading in credit. So you have to create credit. We have to have finance. We have to have a system of assigning credit and transfers of credit. But what is forbidden here is to make a living off of selling credit. The problem, as, as I see, so, so, there, so why, why would this be good? One of them is it will prevent over leverage. If I can't just sell credit, I won't allow somebody to borrow indiscriminately. I'll have to say, well, what are you buying with this money? And have to make sure that there's enough equity in the property and so on. And that's why you have to have a down payment, right? Otherwise, it's infinite leverage. Um, and, it has to, and, and it reduces the chances of bankruptcy for the same reason. It disallows profiteering. You know, just uh, recognizing that people uh, need credit, and I can give it to them in lots of ways that will be halal. I remember Avram Yudovich, who's a history professor at uh, Princeton, when he first heard about this Islamic finance, and I was taking this position. He said, just from out of one book of 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 uh, of Sarahsi, Mabsud, I have you know enough tricks in order to do anything I want. And indeed, the, the Hanafis were notorious for writing books of, uh, they called them Kutub al-Hayal, basically the legal stratagems to get around the prohibitions. But their point was never to actually get around the prohibition as it exists in the Quran and Sunnah. It's to get around the fine print that was written by other lawyers, by other jurists. So this is lawyers playing against lawyers. Unfortunately, I think we're using it now for profiteering. Uh, now, why, and marking to market is only one piece of it. Marking to market is only one piece of it. It's not the whole thing. The drawback is um, if, if you don't make it a business a for profit business, if you make it like a credit union or a mutual bank, something that's not for profit, where basically the depositors are themselves the owners, then there won't be so much profit to go around from the Sharia arbitrage in order to hire the lawyers and hire the payroll jurists and all those, um, the people who basically cre create the, the tricks for the Sharia arbitrage for you. So that doesn't happen. The advantage is we already have it. We already have mutual banking. We already have credit unions. We already have various forms that can be used 
for actually ensuring that people don't over leverage, that it's done the right way, and then you can add in some ethics into the, the mix, and, and, and then you can talk about faith-based. It's not about you know that, that we, we are trapped in the in, in, in the in medieval times and we have to apply rules of jurisprudence of that time. It's really uh, it has to be more than that. Uh, the the brand name uh, has to be uh, more more of a community based uh, brand name rather than uh, a, a legal legal one, especially when the name of the game is is playing uh, legal tricks. Now I'm not accusing anybody uh, in this room definitely of doing that, but. Uh, but that is what the industry is about. And I find it distasteful that the industry uses the word, you don't use the word Islamic even. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, right. I just, uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking about the industry, yes, yes. No, I mean, the, the, nice, the nice thing about operating within the U.S. regulatory framework actually is that you have the, I'm, I'm saying the protections the protections that the jurists were writing about in medieval times are already there in U.S. laws. The, the protections are already there. You can add more protections if you want, but at least if you're, if you're, if you're obeying the laws of the land, I, I feel comfortable that it's Islamic to start with. And then if you add other things like being community sensitive and you know, working with people who wouldn't have access to credit and so on, that's wonderful. But uh, the problem is that there's a lot that's, that's being done in the name of Islam in this Islamic finance industry that's really just pure Sharia arbitrage, just pure profiteering in the name of religion. And uh, you know that there will be another crisis like BCCI or worse, and it will tarnish. I mean, Dr. Reha was talking earlier about others who play fast and loose and bring in my, quit, hot money from, from other parts of the world to buy a whole bunch of homes and then go and market them back in that part of the world. And, and you know someday somebody's going to use that for, for something uh, uh, improper, and then it's going to tarnish the whole industry's name. So uh, I, I hope that Islamic finance would be, would be more about community-based initiatives and, uh, and less about, uh, about you know, the uh, reinterpretations of, of, um, of medieval sharia. Thank you.